Uh, I'd like to invite Paul to start with his session on strategic financial modeling. Paul, please take it away. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate you guys uh, inviting me to, to do this. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining. So this is one of my favorite topics. Hopefully it kind of shows as kind of I go through it. Uh, and, um, you know, as my time as a VC um, uh, and uh, prior to starting Graphite, I spent a lot of time uh, investing in companies and then kind of supporting them with their financial models and uh, going through that sort of strategic exercise of looking at different scenarios and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, is with Graphite, we we do that quite a bit as well. Uh, so, so um, to start, we actually do have a financial model template just on our website. It's free, no no, no strings attached. We just put it up there. Um, thousands and thousands of startups use it. We just threw it up there and uh, uh, use it as a resource. So I'm going to speak through it a bit. We're not going to really do a live demo. It's fairly self-explanatory how we have it, but I'll talk through some of the best practices around building it. Uh, so we have one for more kind of SaaS and, or, or B2B companies and one for more consumer, whether you're, D, whether you're D2C or e-commerce or just kind of a CPG company generally. So um, we could start there. Um, the reason we're kind of going through this is, you know, it, it's, it's really more important than ever. Um, you know, I'm sure we have mostly founders on this session here uh, and, the environment we're in is 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 certainly different than it was, and and we'll go into that. And and this is being you know definitely scrutinized quite a bit more during diligence processes than before. I want to go through using kind of building an actual model that you can use, uh, keeping it pretty simple, and then we're going to do a little bit about unit economics as well. Um, so, just to start. Here, so this is kind of you know I'm using this, and this is from the movie Grey Gatsby. So this is, I remember meeting uh, one of our clients um, and this is about in 2019, we were at a Starbucks in Midtown. And I think in multiple conversations, I, I was hearing like VC things like, oh, I just raised or, oh, this or oh, that. And it just seemed like every company was raising a lot of money and crushing it. Um, and, um, and, and money has been flowing into startups like crazy. Uh, for, for years, right? So the environment's changed a little bit, but frankly, from my, our perspective, and we support hundreds of companies, uh, hundreds of startups on uh, the uh, finance and accounting side. Um, for earlier stage, not, not as much uh, of a change, uh, but nonetheless, I feel like VC now looks a little bit more like this, right? So you're hearing more uh, requests for, you know, kind of really understanding the economics, is there a path towards profitability if we have to, uh, and different things like that? So we're, you know, we're getting quite a bit more companies come to us and looking for financial models um, ahead of sort of a maybe a board meeting that you're dreading, or maybe a fundraise, or uh, frankly, and we'll go into this just having more comfort in your own business, and we'll kind of go into difference here. So two things, main things uh, that we're going to kind of cover. Uh, at a high level. One is uh, what I call the modeler's dilemma, um, and the other is the founder's dilemma. So the modeler's dilemma, and, and again, the modeler, the person building the model could be the founder. Um, you know, obviously, Graphite does this too, and we work with founders, but, you know, you could at least start with our template. But one is if you make it too simple, then if you don't hit plan, you won't know why. And if you make it too complex, you'll never be able to update it. Um, and I've seen this before. Uh, one of the first companies back in 2013 uh, that uh, I had invested in as a VC uh, at a seed stage fund in New York, um, they had sort of an outsourced CFO build a financial model for them, uh, one of our portfolio companies. And it was so complicated. I, I mean, like ours has a lot of tabs because it kind of has to, but I mean, like 40 tabs, um, formulas that are impossible to interpret, right? And even the CFO uh, themselves had a really hard time figuring out and we had to scrap it and redo it. So if it becomes impossible to maintain or use that kind of eliminates, then you just won't use it. And then the whole thing is garbage because that's the point is to actually use it frequently. Uh, and then the founder's dilemma, and this is really tough too, especially in this fundraising environment. One is if you're too conservative, you start second guessing yourself. Well, if I present these numbers, does it look more like a lifestyle business? Is this 
really something a VC would be interested in. Um, and you start kind of going there. And then if it's too aggressive, and I've seen this, right, I, I, I had a portfolio company um, prior to starting Graphite that, um, you know, honestly, I mean, I, I think they're, I think they're five, you know, the fifth year in their projection was like the GDP of a small country, um, not even a small country. <laughs> it was, it was insane. And it was like, that's clear. It's important. No company has ever grown that fast in history. It, it probably won't be you. Right. So if you, if you go too aggressive, you look naive, um, and, and that doesn't look good either. So we're going to talk through how to get around these things, um, uh, or at least think them through. So, the one thing is I'm going to use a few different uh, I'm going to use a few different uh, names for this. One is a budget, a forecast, projection, a model, pro forma, financial plan, strategic model, whatever it is. And people will use this, and VCs will use it differently. It's all the same. Every single one of these things mean the exact same thing. The only difference is your budget is like the one that you said you're going to hit. And, and maybe showed your investors or your board, if you have a board set up already, that's like the one. Save it as a copy, label it clearly. That's the one you do a budget versus actual against. In a separate copy, you could be changing the thing all the time because things change. Ah, eh, we're going to do this higher later. We're not going to make this higher. Oh, this client came in. You're always going to change it. And then if things are diverging enough from your you know, original plan, to kind of your most up-to-date thing you're working on, then you can present that. And it's like, oh, this is our new forecast. Things change in a startup and that's fine. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of how I recommend doing it there. Um, what, the what it should be uh, is really think about it as your record of truth for everything that has happened, at least over the last like 12 months. I, you know, I, I recommend even year to date is probably not enough. So if you were building a model now, I'd probably start it at 2000, the beginning of maybe 2021, if your company was around, uh, and then all the way, bring it out to, to date and then, you know, have it out, go out for a few years. So, but everything that's kind of happened and you think will happen, the things that have happened are coming from your QuickBooks and you export them, you import them into the model. Um, the things that are going to happen are based on assumptions. Um, and the way I view a model um, as, uh, as CEO of this company and the way I ask our clients to view their model. It's almost like a, an instruction manual um, on how to actually hit those things, right? So it should, you know, it should kind of tell you what you need to do in terms of marketing and on the operation side and in terms of like what, what the kind of the uh, capacity you need on the sales side and the ramp up time to ramp up salespeople and really have, you know, and really, um, you know, think through kind of how you're going to, um, uh, funnel leads to those salespeople and things like that. So think of it, so think about it as uh, that. And then if you're not doing those things, you probably won't hit your targets. So you'll know ahead of time uh, if you're if you're diverging from plan. So a couple things about like what 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 this is and what this isn't. So this is not a valuation model. Um, I feel like I have a this is really important. So um, I would highly uh, recommend against. Um, building a financial model, and I've seen this, right, pre-revenue company, building a model and using it as a means to justify a valuation. Um, no, it, you know, early stage investment, it's, it's, it's a negotiation, there's a market. Uh, if you go to an investor and say, hey, this is our model, um, we're, you know, we, we barely started the company, but based on this discounted cash flow analysis, I, I think uh, the business is worth this. And it's if anything like that alone could kind of turn an investor off because it's just out of market. No, no one really does that. So, but it is use it as an operating model. Say, hey, this is how I'm thinking about the business. This is how I under. This is how this is how I um, this is how I'm gonna do. This is how I'm gonna move forward to actually grow the company. This these are the hires I want to make. This is how we're gonna go to market. That's really what it's all about. Um, so view it, and, and all these are, are pretty similar, right? Uh, it, if you're viewing it as something investors are making you do, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, use it as a tool you actually use. Uh, build it as a tool you actually use to help you run and guide the business. Uh, and it's more, it really is more important than ever because you have to be a little bit more careful on cash now. Um, the Excel, you could definitely, you know, the Excel side, yes, you could do crazy formulas, but I recommend against it. 
um, you should really focus on, um, you know, just really, it's, the, it's one of the only times as a business, you have all these ideas and decks and conversations and you're having partnership conversations and you're sitting with your team. It's the only time you could really get all of that together and put it on paper. So that's really what you should use it for mainly. Um, it should have three statements, our template does. Um, and uh, again, it should map to your, it should map to your accounting in real life, assuming you have QuickBooks set up. When it diverges, it makes it really, really hard to compare. Like if things don't happen in real life, if you don't hit plan, if it's not, if it doesn't sync up to your QuickBooks or Zero or whatever it is you're using, it's going to be really hard to see where you've kind of gone wrong or what's changed. Um, and then it, generally it is a spreadsheet, but there are, are tools. One of them is Finmark uh, that some of our clients use. Uh, that's really good. Um, and uh, so cloud tool, sort of cloud tools are becoming more popular um, as well. So the first lesson that I, and, you know, I'm not sure quite the audience, but if you have a board, if you're going out to investors early, if you're kind of a first time entrepreneur, this is a really important one. And I've seen this lesson learned uh, I've learned it myself. I've seen countless, uh, I've seen countless uh, other founders learn this lesson. But the most important thing is to be true to yourself when you're building a model and thinking through your business and do what you feel is achievable. No one knows the business more than you as the founder at the end of the day. No one understands your business more than you. So you have to build a model for you. Um, and I'll explain what that basically means. Um, so it's common uh, to put forth a very aggressive projection and that, that's okay. Uh, sometimes it's um, sort of artificial, uh, you know, you're like, yeah, what if, what will investors think? Is this not aggressive enough? Is it too aggressive, whatever? But usually, you know, entre you know entrepreneurs tend to be uh, optimists, right? And they, it, it tends to be uh, more on the more aggressive side. So I've seen, you know, these conversations before, you know, um, show me a plan, that um, hits whatever, right? Show me a plan that gets you to profitability. Show me, even if you're pre-revenue or something, right? Show me a plan that gets you to a billion, not a billion, but 10 million in revenue or 10 million ARR or something like that within two years. And founders will, and, and the, that's coming from the investor, founders will put that down on paper, right? They want the investor to invest, right? But, um, Often, I think behind doing that, I'm like, well, I guess I could make this happen. I'm going to really try, but is that actually humanly possible? And so I've seen, and these are real quotes at the bottom I have here. Um, you know, one is, you know, a company that was trying to, that was being really aggressive here was like it was going through the exercise of, you know, like, oh, you know, if only revenue, my projected revenue ne next year is going to be this many millions. And then was it was like, who, who am I trying to please here? Like, I'm not, no one's forcing me to do this. I don't even think it's possible. So why am I putting things that aren't going to happen? Then it's just going to kind of screw me up. Um, I've also heard, you know, my board really wants me to push and, and th things never go perfectly correct, you know, right when you're, when you're building a startup, but I'm not sure these things are possible um, with all the resources in the world, right? It is, and you've seen this in the market, you have companies, growth companies that kind of got ahead of themselves on hiring and ahead of themselves on scale. Things simply take time with startups. Um, those first formative years, are, you're really thinking about the product, your go-to-market strategy, where you fit into the world. Uh, and sometimes if you throw a billion dollars at it, you won't grow much faster. Uh, or maybe you will, but then your churn will be super high. So, uh, so anyway, the, this is just keep this in mind and, you know, and this, this does happen. Um, and, and I've seen this really backfire, right? When, when we have, we've certainly had our share of, um, well, you know, back when I was an investor and now you get in this vicious cycle sometimes where you're missing plan. Your investors are also, your board is, are also your investors. You're, you're kind of like, all right, I think we had an issue this quarter or this, for, you know, for this half of the year, but these, there's sort of one-time things and I think it'll be better. And you put forth an aggressive projection again, but then you miss that again. They will fatigue uh, and they will lose, you will certainly lose trust. So okay is missing plan in the startup. 
so long as you have an action plan as to what to do next, not okay is doubling down and just kind of like praying it gets better. Uh, and, and I've seen that and, and not bringing things back to reality and having that difficult conversation. Like, hey guys, I don't think this is, it's just not gonna happen, right? We're, it's just gonna take longer and more money uh, than we thought. And it's a hard conversation. It could end your business, right? But it is, uh, and, and no, no one wants that, but I think most investors appreciate that more, you know, the just honest approach. Um, and just a couple things quick, you know, where, where SaaS companies get into trouble, and then I'll do a little bit consumer as well. One is I spoke about this, um, and this all relates to modeling again, because we're putting everything on paper, trying to figure it out for the future. One is scaling too fast, too soon, pre real product market fit. Sometimes you have those early couple deals, you're getting positive feedback from potential customers, and then you like quadruple headcount and burn really increases. And so sometimes taking those incremental steps when you're really confident that you're there is, is the best way to do it. So that's one um, optimistic timing on enterprise, especially very enterprise deals. Um, I was an investor uh, in a company that's now a unicorn, uh, like, and then some will probably be a decacorn soon. Um, but I remember during the diligence process, uh, the amount of incredible, incredible leads they had during their sales process, and this is as a seed stage company, was unbelievable. Um, those deals landed, but literally years later. So you couldn't count on cash flow from those because some very, very, very large deals take a very, very long time to close and you have to mold your product around it. Um, the other thing is when cash flow is nowhere near net income, right? The way we're building a model and it is, is uh, a cruel basis um, because that, that's kind of the way investors need to look at it. But cash is cash. That's just what's in your bank. So when you, for example, if you're a SaaS company, you have, you have annual contracts, that's great because it's giving you cash flow as a business. The counter to that is if you land a bunch of those in a row, you're seeing revenue hitting and net income looks pretty decent, but that ca you already have the cash and you're just recognizing the revenue over time. So I've seen like, for SaaS companies, especially ones that have a lot of annual and kind of quarterly contracts and cash flow, just cash swings wildly. Like you could have a, a month where you have, you know, a $100,000 loss on the PL, but you could burn half a million dollars. And I've seen actually more exaggerated examples of that. The next month, maybe you're profitable by 200, but you just have to be careful because it could be pretty wild there. And we model that stuff in for you. Uh, and and the, 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 the template attempts to do that too. And then just differentiating working capital plus versus actual burn. It's very nuanced. And I know there's debt available to, to startups as well. And it's supposed to be more for, for a sort of uh, working capital. But if you kind of commingle it all, um, it just goes away, right? So really thinking about what your actual working capital needs are versus just your almost kind of R&D and just general kind of startup expense uh, is important. Consumer brands, pretty similar. One is not paying enough attention to CAC and not kind of looking at attribution and cohorts close enough, uh, putting too much weight into organic. Um, I've seen companies, uh, consumer brands that have a ton of organic but when they, you know, when they step on the gas pedal um, for paid, it doesn't, it doesn't change that much, um, especially in this current environment, uh, in terms of how many new customers are getting and things like that. So it can get tricky there. Uh, and then looking at payback periods and inventory needs as well. Uh, oh, and then of course, looking at the exit environment for your business, just be, and this is, this kind of is really important for, I think every startup, but we're all sort of in, um, we're sort of all in the VC space here, the startup space, but different types of companies just have different exit outcomes. Uh, SaaS uh, versus something that's a little bit more transactional in nature, even if it's also software, it's just valued differently. Consumer things valued differently, services valued differently, marketplaces are valued differently. Understanding where you fit and what your business really is, is important. Um, because as we're modeling out burn and, and your cash needs, it really could tell you a lot um, about um, how much cash you're going to need and therefore how much you think you're going to get diluted. 
how much preference is going to be in front of you. And, you know, and hopefully it doesn't, you don't price yourself out of an exit or, or end up with nothing during an exit because you had so much preference in front of you. Um, so back to more pure modeling stuff. So, um, you know, this is important, kind of a, a good model really should just help you make decisions. And these are the main ones, basic, basic stuff. When are we gonna run out of money? That's important. Therefore, when should I start fundraising? Okay, it looks like it's saying my revenue, I think realistically my revenue is gonna be here at that point. So is it a series A I should be targeting in six months to a year? Is it more of, do we just probably need an extension? Um, and that's really what, you know, and so it's important because it, it tells you kind of what you, what your um, next fundraise is going to look like, right? And if you, uh, you, you end up in a bit of a bind, if you are like, you know, now we're going to do our A, but if you're just not hitting those A milestones and you're going to A investors, you're going to waste months and then get a lot of, well, you're a little bit too early. We want to see X. Um, and we're going back to that. Things are tighter again. So there are more, it's not like, it's not like an automatic A, you know, if you, if you raised a seed and had like a little bit of traction, right? It's, it's gonna go back to the mean, what it's been. Um, so um, again, it needs to be realistic and you need to believe in, that you could actually hit it um, or it's just numbers on a piece of paper or, or a spreadsheet, whatever it is. Um, what's working, what isn't. And then it should also, you should also be able to just do a few basic scenarios with it. like. What if things take longer than expected? So, you know, what if revenue grows slower? Um, what if our margins are a little bit worse for some reason? For, it's not really a thing as much for kind of SaaS companies, but it, consumers certainly getting hit there with supply chain stuff. Um, what if we miss some revenue? What if I, what if customer acquisition cost is, is higher than we thought? You know, all these sorts of things, the model should just have assumptions play with it a little bit and, you know, real time, you could see what kind of happens to your cash and what you think the business is going to look like. So it's important to use it as a tool for that and that it does those things. Um, you can see I'm talking about this whole realistic thing a lot um, because it is, uh, it really is just, if there's one thing you take out of this, make it, just make it realistic, make it something you could actually do um, and you believe in, uh, because again, it's, it's, it's really doesn't help anyone otherwise. So the second lesson here is just to keep it simple. Um, this is a really, really important, and there's a fine balance here. Number one, there again, there's gonna be various assumptions in the model. So, but if you build a model um, that is more detailed than your kind of the data sources you have to feed those assumptions in real life, you're not gonna be able to ever confirm or update the model. Uh, and I, I have seen this before. We, we very much push against it. Uh, when we see a model is going deeper and than their actual than the actual operations of the business can support, we, we push back. It needs to kind of be hand in hand with your actual, not just accounting, but even just understanding how your pipeline converts and being able to take your whatever it is, Salesforce, pipe drive, whatever your CRM you're using, and say, okay, this is what's sitting in here now. This is how I, this is how it will end up closing over time and distribute. Um, so even having that level of data available uh, is important. So again, for I, I'm saying e-commerce and SaaS, but you know, there you kind of figure out where you fit in there. But at a minimum, you need to in real life, you need to be able to figure out what your CAC by channel is, how much you're spending there your average order value, your margins, your repeat rates. So you can kind of cohort out your, uh, your customers. Um, and for SaaS companies at a minimum, and it's crazy if, if you're a SA if you're a founder and haven't done this, I, this, you, we don't, you don't need us for this. Take each of your sales people. Um, and you know, often I know I was the sole <laughs> salesperson when we first started the company, but put your sales people down, maybe you included, um, their comp month by month, and then also all the deals they've closed. And so you can understand your ramp time for a salesperson and your break-even horizon uh, for a salesperson. So that's not hard to do, especially if you're smaller, you only have a couple people on sales, if anything. Um, and then, you know, if it, and then you have to consider the marketing side as well and, and all that, it all flows together. But at a minimum, you could see that. And I've, 
frankly, I've, I've, we've had a client that top line revenue was growing, um, burn was growing too, but that's okay. But when we, when we kind of looked under the hood and peeled back all the layers of what was happening, we saw that they had sales reps that had been around for years and none of them even came close to breaking even on themselves. So for every salesperson they had, because um, the market was actually a marketplace, so the margins weren't the best. So, you know, the revenue seemed good, but when you look at the actual margins and, and based on the kind of retention curve, it appeared that if you model it out even to five years, some of those sales reps would never break even on themselves. Uh, so the break even horizon is like years. That's not good. Um, six months is good. Even 12 months is okay. Even, even 18 for like a more enterprisey. But if it's going to be three, four years to break even on your uh, investment, that's not ideal. So it's an easy exercise that you could just do in a Google sheet. It'll take you probably an hour. Recommend doing that. So back to the model. Again, our template, other ones out there usually have a payroll tab. You just put your team in it and the people you want to hire. That, I mean, for most companies outside of con consumer, usually the biggest expense is marketing. But for most other businesses, it's the personnel that are building the company. That alone gets you very close to what your burn is going to be. If you're pre-revenue, that, that, that's almost it. And then there's a few of you have other expenses, maybe maybe it's co-working space rent or this, or you have other things, um, but that's the biggest piece, right? So just doing that, this is easy and you start getting close already. Then you do expenses. For us, we go vendor by vendor. Um, you know, we're, it's, I, I think if you're very small, you could just go vendor by vendor, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, mid-sized company, you know, uh, like us, we're, we're approaching 100. Uh, employees. I, I still go vendor by vendor. Um, and then, um, you know, grow, you know, and then, or you could just kind of do a, a, a kind of a growth assumption if you're larger. So you could definitely do that too. Uh, but anyway, between the payroll and people, you're about 80% of the way there. Um, the hard part is the revenue side. And that's what I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes focusing on. Then we'll probably do questions. So the revenue side of things is more difficult. And I'll show you a couple ideas of, of how we like to do this. So one is, and I, I think, I don't know if I took this from a client or it was like an artistic interpretation of a client or past portfolio company, but um, you can't do this for revenue. This is a top-down model, not a bottom-up model. Uh, top-down, you could probably, do, if you're Apple, you could do a top-down model. You know, we're, we're, no one here is Apple. No one here is, is Tesla and figuring out your market penetration. It's how are we going to get our first client? How are we going to get the next 10? So it is bottoms up because look at what happens. You have big, you know, markets are big. You know, hopefully we're all building companies in large markets. Um, and um, even just taking what seems to be a very small percentage of a market makes like ridiculously huge revenue numbers. and. Um, it's impossible to figure out what's actually going to happen. There has to be bottoms up. So, um, and again, going back to being too complex, these are these are actual. Don't make it too complicated uh, and have too too many versions. I'd say for for us, I have my board version, and then I have my working version. That that's literally it. Because and then each time I maybe reforecast, I save that as in a separate folder model I presented to the board at this board meeting, whether the July board meeting, whatever it is, save that separately. But my working version is still the one I play with. So, you know, what I often see if we have tons and tons of versions and whatever, which one did we present to the board? I've seen versions going up to like in the seventies back and forth. It's, it's kind of crazy not being able to figure out formulas. So definitely don't do that. Um, back to revenue. If you're a B2B I say SaaS, it basically just mean B2B where you're, you have a, maybe a sales team and the contracts are meaty enough where you can kind of look at them on a per name basis. Um, then the way I recommend doing, um, doing it is you start out with at the very bottom layer, what your MRR is now. And then again, you assume some kind of a churn rate. Then you look at your actual pipeline. Well, we have this much in the pipe. 
we think this much will close and we think it'll close over this time horizon. And then last, well, we have so many, we have X amount of salespeople and this, these many leads are coming in and we're gonna do some calculation, figuring out what that looks like in the future. The real clients were the most real, the top is the least real, so to speak. You know, it, it, not to say it doesn't happen, you know, tomorrow you may meet a client, a potential client that is not in your pipeline today, and that's okay, right? We'll model that out for the future. Um, the end result looks like this. So if I'm a VC, and I was, and, and I work with a lot of VCs, but um, seeing this is way easier than, uh, than kind of any other way to look at your revenue growth, right? This is not all I wanna see, but what was your existing revenue? Um, and, and that's the bottom, that's the blue. Um, what is your projected revenue that you think is going to close and that's in your pipe now? And then what's the projected stuff after that? And I can, I can kind of discount and most VCs will take the model and kind of discount that at least a little bit, but it helps you understand kind of what the growth is going to end up looking like. Um, further, I like to enhance this red one and it looks a little bit like this. And even within your pipeline, I may want to know as an investor, well, what have you closed, just not implemented? For those of you who are founders that have some traction or, uh, or second time founders, you know, just when you close a deal, there's a big difference between bookings and actual recognized revenue, a client that's fully onboarded, there's no technical issue, it's past the pilot period where they've either been billed, but regardless, we're earning the revenue. There's a lag there. So what's closed? you know, where have we, you know, which ones we think are going to close that are in the kind of contract phase, proposal phase, so on and so on. And then for e -com, I think just basing it, you can't do it to that level of detail because you may have tens or hundreds of thousands of, of customers. Um, and, you know, but at a minimum, looking at subscribers, if you have a subscription element, um, non-subscription orders, and then your kind of you know, your wholesale or, or whatever it is. And this is becoming bigger now, a bigger focus because selling things online is, as we've seen, Facebook stock uh, has crashed uh, thanks to Apple, uh, is primarily uh, because, uh, you know, their largest revenue stream is uh, advertising and companies are having a hard time uh, advertising on Facebook. Last piece here, man, we are going to be, <laughs> we're going to be tight on time, but um, knowing your numbers, uh, and I'm going to talk about unit economics a little bit. Num the main thing is build a model you can speak to inside and out. You don't need to be, I think investors understand you are not, you don't need to be a CFO to start a company. Um, you, but you do need to understand your, your business. You need to understand the model because it's what you're going to do. It's your blueprint. Um, and, um, you know, and, 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 you know, looking at sort of the economics and, and the model, you know, it kind of says things about the business. So one is if you have kind of a hastily put together model that kind of doesn't really make sense, I've almost never seen a company that like either doesn't have a model at all or has one that's like one of those weird ones that I showed before where it's like, we're going to hit 10% or, you know, 0.01% penetration of the market than this and this. I've almost never seen any of those really knock it out of the park. And it's not because the model makes the business work. The model isn't creating product market fit, but it shows like, you know, sort of a, an acumen towards this stuff and, uh, uh, and respect towards the business side of the, you know, and the financial side of the business. So um, I think also, you know, poor unit economics, um, which, you know, are certainly going to be looked at by investors. Um, Frankly, I've always viewed it as a proxy for, you know, maybe product market fit that isn't there yet. Um, and it's, it's funny, it doesn't mean that the product you've built isn't the right thing or there isn't a buyer. Sometimes it's just the way you're going to market, the way the sales team is set up, the way the leads are coming into the company, the way you, the, your narrative about how you explain who you are and what you stand for and what you do, um, how, you, how you approach your customer. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Um, sometimes pricing is just wrong. I've seen companies that just just don't charge enough, and like it's impossible. You need to it's like how many how many apples do you need to sell 
to make this thing work. And if it's like more apples than, you know, exist in the world, it's not going to work. So sometimes it's just undercharging and not understanding the market quite enough. Um, regardless, like if you, if we see that economics or, 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 or unit economics are not looking the best, like it's okay as a, as a startup, no, you know, not every, most startups don't have amazing unit economics, but understanding why that may be the case is important. Um, in this is one of the most, and every single one of our clients now are getting reports uh, on this monthly. We're looking at not just how much runway you have, but how much kind of cash you're burning relative to overall value creation. Um, basically, if you're if you get a million dollars of investment, are you is the value of the business going up by one million? Is it not going up at all because it's kind of all just it's kind of kicking the can down the road, or is it? You've increased, you've got a million, with a million dollars, you've increased the value. Your next round is 30 million higher, right? Then you're doing pretty well. So uh, it's important to look at it there. For any business, we like to cohort things. I'll show you what that means. Um, I'm going to breeze through this because we only have a couple minutes. This is what a cohort analysis looks like. Um, it, basically look, it basically looks at churn month over month uh, within a group of, cu of customers that have come in. Um, and, and so basically for the, you know, the, so like, let's say it's July. Now, if you close 10 deals in July, well, how many of those customers are still customers in August? How many of those July customers are still customers in September and so on and so on. Uh, and that's the way we look at it on the, on the SAS side as well. Um, on the SAS side is, sorry, I just saw you, uh, a question pop up. I just uh, got distracted for a second I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but yeah, basically um, you're looking at kind of what that retention looks like. So you can understand what your payback period looks like. The, the inverse here is your, is your customer lifetime value. So here's two examples. If let's say your these red lines are your co cost to acquire a customer. So let's say your cost, customer acquisition costs like this bottom line is like 80. Well, Okay, if it's 80 and this is your cumulative gross profit from these cut from a given customer on average in a cohort, then all right, you're breaking even in about five, six months. That's pretty good. Um, if it's one, I guess this is probably around 115, you can see you, you probably don't have a business at all. So it's a big, big, big difference. And this is something that we are really, really helping and focusing on uh, with, with our companies because the different, these lines are not that far apart. One is a good business, one, is not a business. It's nothing. It's a charity, I, I guess. Um, so, um, an LTV needs to be when I'm, when we're looking at what's in in here, it has to be net of everything. Your discounts, your this is consumer stuff, but it has to be your gross profit, um, not revenue. Um, and just to show you how pronounced this is, I want to show you retention and reorder rates. Um, the yellow line is a company with very good retention. The blue one is a company without very good retention. So the yellow line is here. Um, oh no, sorry. This is this is the this is the one with bad retention, and this is the one, the break-even horizon and profit side on the uh, with for the other one. So these two lines, just looking at, it's like yeah, you could tell the yellow one is better, but look how pronounced this one will never break even. You know, break even in twenty-four months. That's not a good business. And this one, anything in this kind of in-between where after it crosses is pure incremental cash flow that you could dump back into growing your business. So this is just unbelievable when this happens. And I think we're a little short uh, on time. I, so I do wanna just kind of go to questions. Um, and I don't, I, you know, maybe we could share these slides after if anyone uh, has interest in it. Um, and yeah, so with that, happy to do some questions. I'm going to unshare my screen and I see at least one came up, uh, which I could see. Uh, so one is um, with a seed round, how much runway are consumer companies targeting currently? I would say for any company, uh, so it's a little different for consumer. So you want to, so when I, when I said, think about what your working capital is versus your actual burn, really try to figure out, um, really try to figure out what that, uh, what that sort of looks like. Um, so 
because there are a lot of, for consumer brands, there are a lot of working capital solutions out there. Um, there's all sorts of different ways that you can bridge the gap between buying materials, supply, or, or, or finished goods, and then reselling them and bridging those several month gap. That's your real working capital there um, versus, you know, we're just getting off the ground. We need people to run the business. So at a, regardless, for any company, I'd say absolute minimum, try to target 12 months. Um, I've always said that. But really, um, I would try to go actually further than that, uh, 18 months, uh, just because I, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, anecdotally, to me, at early stage startups, yeah, you know, investment, investment is a little bit harder to come around, but the world is moving along. Uh, so it's not the end of the world, but we don't know what's going to happen. Could we go into a recession? So I would just t take the money when you don't need it. That, that's, a, that's contrary to what I think a lot of investors may say. Um, you, know, only, you don't want to over dilute yourself if you don't need it. But I think if you have the opportunity to take money, take a little bit more than you think. Things never go quite to plan. And, I would, uh, and, and that's kind of the way I would think about it. Okay. And are there any other questions? Thanks, Paul, for that great session. I think we can quickly take one more question. Sure. Uh, when should you start your model or how far should you uh, show in historicals? Yeah, so I would start, um, you know, either if you started the business recently, just go back to the beginning of time, right? Like, let's say you started, even if you started in 2020, you might as well just start the thing when you started the business. Um, but if you've been around for like three or four years, at a minimum, start the model, maybe at this point, maybe the beginning of 2021. If that, if, if that, I've seen cases where companies started, you know, over the past couple of years, but didn't do much in 2021 and are really going in 2022, uh, really getting ramped up in 2022, then maybe 2022, but at, at least a year, right? And then go out three years, anything past, you know, it, your, your 12 month time horizon, you should have a pretty good handle on what that's going to look like. But, you know, everyone knows like two, three, four years out the road, it's, you're not going to really know what the business exactly looks like. All right. So there's another one. What expenses do you see commonly missed or forgotten in uh, forecasts? So I'd say, you know, you, you'd be surprised. I mean, the, the biggest the biggest thing is, or is honestly hires because that's the biggest expense that a company, at least any out, anything outside of kind of a, a product company, consumer brand, um, it's going to be the people. So sometimes what I see is people are really giving a lot of thought into their hiring plan for the next 12 months, but not a heck of a lot after there. And then you end up with this artificially low headcount to support a business. Like you're not going to have a higher revenue per employee than Google or Apple. It's like, it's almost impossible. So, you know, it, some, sometimes a gut check we do is just, you know, in, in the model, just what is your annualized revenue per employee? And if it's millions, you probably don't have enough people, employees baked into your plan. So a lot of it is just that. Um, and then, you know, if anything else, it's um, understanding how your if you're a SaaS company running an AWS, what does um, what is that sort of how does that scale with your revenue? Is it linearly? Is it step function? So thinking about that large expense too. All right, thank you so much, Paul. We know that you have to hop off. So thank you for the session today, thank and you. we will see. Thank you. Yeah.